nothing is impossible to the mind. All its guidance and power are available to you. When you have fully realized thought causes all, you will know there will never be any limits that you yourself do not impose. Beautifully written. That was written by U.S. Anderson, marvelous author. Magic in Your Mind, Secret of Secret, Three Magic Words, great author. This is Bob Proctor with a very important part of your success puzzle. We're on page 51, Your Infinite Supply. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. That's Mark eleven twenty four. Now, just prior to that, I believe it's in 23, we are told if we wanted to move a mountain, if we prayed, believing it, we'd move the mountain. Let's think of it again. You can find this in the Quran. You can find it in the Torah. You can find it in the Bhagavad Gita. It's in all of the great books. The Bible, by the way, is not a book. It's the Biblia. It's a library of 66 books. Just some phenomenal information in it. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Do you know that every prayer is answered? No prayer goes unanswered. Everything you pray for, you will receive. Now, do you know that most people are praying for what they don't want? Praying is what most people do between prayers. You see, prayer is the movement that takes place between spirit and form with and through us. I have a couple of good friends, Marty Jeffrey, Al Kiernan, and they're always kidding me. And they'll say, you don't have to pay Bob. The universe pays him. He gets his pay from the universe. And that's true. I do. And so do you. And so do they. And by the way, they're being very well paid by the universe. Now, the universe pays me and it'll pay you, and our compensation will always be an exact ratio to our service. See, nothing happens by accident. This is a spiritual universe you and I are a part of, and spirit operates by law. Law is the uniform and orderly method of the omnipotent God. Spirit never expresses itself other than perfectly. It's important that you understand that. The imperfection we experience is the result of our individual or collective ways of thinking. You are a spiritual being and as such have been endowed with the unique ability to think. Therefore, your source of supply is infinite. Wow. Your source of supply is infinite. Do you know what that means? I know I don't know what it means. You see, infinite is without beginning or end, and I don't believe our mind can grasp that. Yet, it doesn't matter what we get, we can get more. It doesn't matter what we do, we can do more. It doesn't matter how good we feel, we can feel better. It doesn't matter how good our relationships are, they can improve. Why? Because we're dealing with an infinite source of supply. Thought is the preamble to everything, and your ability to originate thought and mentally move in a thought-filled world is your guarantee of an abundant life. Every material object that you see, hear, smell, taste, or touch is the manifestation of a non-physical power, which is spirit. You see, spirit's omnipresent. You know what that means? That means it's 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. All the knowledge that there ever was or ever will be is also 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. Same with the power. All the power is omnipresent. In other words, you've got all the power you'll ever need. We don't have to get power. We don't even have to get energy. We have to learn how to release it. Desire is the triggering mechanism to release energy. Now, as a spiritual being, you have access to everything you will ever want or need to live the life you choose. Your degree of awareness of this beautiful truth will manifest as results in your life. Now, you know, that tells you something. A pretty good teacher taught us, by their fruits you'll know them. We're saying the same thing here, aren't we? Your degree of awareness of this beautiful truth will manifest as results in your life. So, you could take it back the other way. Then the results are going to tell you what the degree of awareness is. We never hide anything. We telegraph everything to the world. Just take a look at a person's results, and it'll tell you where they're living. You've got to take a look on page 52. 
There are four paragraphs here that I would recommend you might read every day for the next 60 days. It's on the spirit of opulence. And this is so well written. Now, of course, Trower is one of my favorite authors, too. If we clearly realize that the creative power in ourselves is unlimited, then there is no reason for limiting the extent to which we may enjoy what we can create by means of it. Where we are drawing from the infinite, we need never be afraid of taking more than our share. That is not where the danger lies. The danger is in not sufficiently realizing our own richness and in looking upon the externalized products of our creative power as being the true riches instead of the creative power of spirit itself. We just got to talk about this for a moment. You see, if we realize that the creative power in ourself is unlimited, then we know that we can always do it bigger and do it better because it's spirit that's doing the work. We merely choose what's going to happen. Now, when we're drawing on the infinite, he says, you never have to worry about taking more than your share. And he said, that's not the danger. The danger is not sufficiently realizing our own riches. And then what's he say? We covered it in a previous lesson. He said, the danger is in using your senses and looking at your physical results and let that represent your riches, the cars, the houses, the money. It's like the little boy said, okay, dad, we've got the two cars, we've got the two houses, we've got the two whatever. What's next? You see, it's not in what you've got. It's in what you are. Everything you own at the time of your death is going to belong to someone else. But what you are is yours forever. All science and all theology tells you nothing's created or destroyed. That postulates one theory, the theory of life. No, no. Your riches is in your mind. Your riches is in this infinite source of supply that we can draw on. We don't have to worry about hoarding it. You want to keep it moving. Now look at the second paragraph on page 52. If we avoid this error, there is no need to limit ourselves in taking what we will from the infinite storehouse. All things are yours. I love that. You see, the more money you have, the more things you have, the more comfortable you can be. Now, there's a danger on that, too. It could take control over you. Why do you think it was written that it is more difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it was for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? I'll tell you why it is. Because the riches start to take control of us. We worship the things, and they start to own us. If you're at a point where you don't want to lend something, you should give it away because it's owning you. All things are yours. You have everything. Everything in the universe is yours. It's like the guy said, you're the king's kid. And the way to avoid this error is by realizing that the true wealth is in identifying ourselves with the spirit of opulence. We want to get in tune with it. We must be opulent in our thought. Do not think money as such, for it's only one means of opulence. But think opulence. That is, largely, generously, liberally, and you will find that the means of realizing this thought will flow to you from all quarters, whether as money or as a hundred other things not to be reckoned with. I always suggest people are generally receiving their good through the keyhole. You should open the doors and the windows and let it flow in. We must not make ourselves dependent on any particular form of wealth or insist on its coming to us through some particular channel. That is, at once, to impose a limitation and to shut out other forms of wealth and to close other channels. But we must enter into the spirit of it. Now, the spirit is life. And throughout the universe, life ultimately consists in circulation, whether within the physical body of the individual or on the scale of the entire solar system. And the circulation means a continual flowing along the spirit of opulence is no exception to this universal flow of all life. Now, come to the bottom paragraph on page 52. There's a great lesson here. When once this principle becomes clear to us, we shall see that our attention should be directed to the giving than the receiving. We must look at ourselves not as misers' chests to be kept locked for our own benefit, but as centers of distribution and the better we fulfill our function as such centers, the greater will be the corresponding inflow.
Well, the thought just crossed my mind that that sheet is worthy of your reading at least a thousand times. And every time you read it, you'll see something in it that's new. It's like Henry Drummond said, when you read a good book through the second time, you don't see something in it you didn't see before. You see something in yourself that wasn't there before. It's vitally important that we learn to follow every suggestion there. Every good that you're looking for is in the universe. Look on page 53. Now, do you know, frequently I'll hold up an acorn in a seminar and I'll ask how many people believe that there's an oak tree in the acorn and inevitably 75% of the people got their arms stuck right up trying to reach the ceiling. They believe there's an oak tree. There's no oak tree in the acorn. There isn't any oak tree in the acorn. The oak tree is in the universe. There's a pattern plan in the acorn. There's a nucleus, a pattern plan that controls the vibratory rate of the acorn. Look on page 53. Now look right in the center of the acorn. See the little lines? Those lines represent a nucleus that sets up a vibration. Now, if we were to keep that acorn in our pocket or on a desk, it would disintegrate. Why? For the same reason we do. When we're not in an environment that's conducive to our unfoldment, the same thing happens to us that happens to the acorn. The acorn dies because it's not in an environment that's conducive to its unfoldment. However, if we take the acorn and we plant it in the earth, instantly and automatically an attractive force is set up. And that acorn will begin to attract all the particles of energy in the earth that are in harmony with it. I want you to build an image in your mind that we have got a glass top table. And we take and we put maybe a half a dozen drops of water on the table. And then very carefully, we take a knife or some object and we push those drops until they touch each other. All six drops keep coming together, one after the other. What happens? We end up with one big drop of water. Now, what do you suppose the odds are against us of separating that one big drop of water into the six same little mass of molecules that we had prior to joining them together? You know it's never going to happen. Have you ever heard the phrase, what God hath joined together? Gives it a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Well, you see, energy that's in harmony, when it comes together, it forms a unity. The two of them come together, they stick, they resonate, they become one with. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to become one with our creator. Well, now we take the acorn and we plant it in the earth. There are millions and millions of levels of vibration. The earth is energy. Now, let's suppose there's earth jammed right up against the acorn, and there is, of course, but it's not in harmony with the acorn. I want you to take a look at the little particles of energy, the little round circles with the arrows. They are marching right towards that acorn. They're in harmony with the acorn. When they touch the acorn, they become one with the acorn, and the acorn does the only thing that it can do. Expansion Greater expression. Isn't that what we said spirit was for? For expansion and greater expression? That's what the acorn's going to do. It expands. Greater expression. And you'll see a little shoot come out of the bottom. And then another shoot comes out of the top. And pretty soon it breaks through the earth. Then it's attracting from the atmosphere, as well as from the earth, particles of energy that are in harmony with the acorn. And before too long, you got the trunk, you got the roots, you got the bark, you got the branches, you got the twigs, you got the leaves. Where'd it all come from? Well, it was here all along. The acorn set up a vibration that attracted them together. You place the acorn in the earth and the oak trees in the universe, but they are attracted to one another. Energy is attracted and becomes one with the acorn. Now, do you know that you operate exactly the same way as the acorn? Now, you see, there's a difference between you and I and the acorn. The acorn has absolutely no ability to alter its vibratory rate. The acorn is programmed. It can only stay in one vibration. The acorn is made from the same stuff your body's made from. It's energy. The acorn's a mass of energy. Put it under a microscope and you're going to see it looks like a sieve. You're going to see a mass of molecules and a high speed of vibration. Well, you'll see exactly the same with your body. You're attracting energy to you and you're attracting whatever vibrates in harmony with you.
This is the end of side 9. Side 10 is already queued up for your listening. Look on page 54. Now let's start to think of how this happens. We're going to go to the top three illustrations. One, three, two. Now we did it that way because we're going to go from one over to two and then back to three. Now I want you to imagine that the E in the center of the page represents energy. We're under one on page 54. Now, I want you to imagine that you've got a glass of water. The W at the bottom of the page represents water. Now, we call it water because the energy is in a physical or a corporeal vibration. See, the energy cannot be created or destroyed, but we can change it. So we take the water that's in a physical vibration or a corporeal vibration, and we add heat to it. What's the water turn into? The water turns into steam. Come halfway up the page, you see the S, that's steam. It's still the same energy, but it's vibrating at a different speed. Why do we call it steam? Because it's moved from a corporeal vibration to an astral vibration. And if we keep adding heat to it, we move it from an astral vibration up to the top, where we'll say is air, ether, gas. That's what the A for is for the air. And it goes from the astral vibration to the E, which is an etheric vibration. Now, look at all the horizontal lines between the WC and the AE. Each one of those lines graphically illustrate a level of vibration or a frequency. Now, here's the part that you want to really grasp. I've taken the little circles and the lines, and I've joined all the lines together. Every frequency is hooked up to the one above and the one below. The truth is they're joined together like the colors of a rainbow. So what you cannot see and what you can see, it's all the same. It just appears to be different. We got a perception problem. Now come down to the diagram right at the bottom of the page of physical senses. If we're living through our senses, we only see what's on a physical or an astral vibration. When it goes beyond that, it's gone. And we say it's nothing, no thing. Say no thing slow, no thing. Take a look at something. One's non-physical, the other's physical. The non-physical always manifests through the physical. Spirit always manifests through its polar opposite, the physical. But can you see what I'm saying here now? If you're living just through your senses, and that's where most people are living, just through their senses, they can only go by what they see. And if they can't see it, it's not there. Now, flip right over to number two. The S is for spirit. The I is for intellect, and the P is for physical. Now, you might write beside the S, I am spirit. And then, I have intellect. I live in a physical body. Now, you'll often hear people say, she's a real intellect. Well, she's not a real intellect. He's not a real intellect. He has one. You have one. I have one. But none of us are an intellect. It's something that we have. We live in the body. Most people think they are their body. They think that's them. That isn't them at all. The body is a molecular structure. It's like the water. In fact, it is mostly water. I am spirit. That means that I am an expression of an infinite power. Now, take and hook all those lines together like I did over on the opposite side of the page because here is millions of levels of vibration and they're all hooked together. And as you hook all them together, you're going to start to see that the spiritual side of your personality and the physical side is all the same. One is the manifestation of the other. The physical is the manifestation of the non-physical. Is this starting to make some sense? Now, let's look at ourselves as a creative being. Come in the center on the third one. Here we are in our conscious mind. We have our intellectual factors. Go to the bottom of the page are the higher faculties. You see, when you're living through your senses, you're working on a competitive plane because it's a limited supply and you've got to get what you can. When you're on the creative plane, there's an infinite supply, so you want to give what you can. Now, when you're dealing on the competitive plane, you're dealing from the physical up. 
when you're dealing on a creative plane, you're going from the spirit down. That's how God works from a higher to a lower. So here we are in our intellectual mind. We've got our imagination. We've got our memory and we can tap into the non-physical. Those little puffy clouds above our head are thoughts. Just put T in there for thoughts. We pull those puffy clouds together and we form an idea. An idea is an image. It's an image. And we take that idea now, put an arrow, and move it down into the heart, into the heart of hearts. As a person thinketh in their heart, so are they. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that's what you reap. These are absolute laws we're working with. This is the most magnificent information. I mean, I get excited every time I go through it. So if you're feeling good about it, you know why. Now, so that I don't leave you in a confused state, I want to explain what everything on this page is. I want you to go to the top drawing under one. You'll see A-E-S-A-W-C. Now go to the outside, W-S-A, going from the bottom up. That's from water to steam to air. Now what we're talking about, the E in the center there is energy. The energy is called water because it's in a corporeal vibration. The C beside the W represents corporeal. You could put P if you want for physical. Now we call it steam because the energy is not in a physical vibration anymore, in a corporeal vibration, and we change the energy, we change the vibratory rate, so it moves from water to steam. It's the same energy. We've gone from a corporeal vibration to the astral vibration. The A beside the E is astral. Now, if we keep adding heat to the energy that we used to call water because it was corporeal, we now call steam because it's astral, we move it on into a non-physical vibration where you cannot reach it with your physical senses. And the A at the top is air and right of it is etheric. So it's at an etheric level. Now there are the levels of vibration. There are millions of them and they're all hooked together. So you see the non-physical energy, if you look up into time and space, and the physical energy, it's all hooked together. Tell me where the water stops becoming water and starts becoming air. There is no point where it stops and there's no point where it starts. Now you come over to the right-hand side of the page. We have the S is for spirit. I am spirit. I am a soul. I don't have one. I have an intellect and I live in a physical body. Now, through the proper use of my intellectual factors, I can tap into my spiritual world, my infinite source of supply. I can build any kind of an idea I want because that's the beginning of creation. And you see me doing that in number three. Look right under number three. You see the stick person. And I am building an idea. I'm using my intellectual factors. I'm thinking. I'm tapping into the non-physical energy, pure and adulterated spirit, thought energy. And I think and I build an idea. And I take the idea and I plant it in my heart. When I plant the idea in my heart, it alters the vibration that my physical body's in. And as my physical body changes its vibration, the behavior changes and so does the results. How do we do this? We do this by becoming acutely aware of what's on the bottom of page 54. You're either going to live through your senses and just keep getting much the same as what you already have, or you're going to live through your creative faculties. God gave you those to create with. Now create. You have an imagination. You have perception. Your perception should be changing of what you're all about as we go through this. You have memory, the will, intuition, and reason. You see, I would encourage you to use those and use them properly. Now flip over onto page 55. Now here we are back with Mark 11:24, and for good reason. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Now just go to the center of the drawing and see the stick person. All this stuff around it I will explain. Your consciousness has the ability with your intellectual factors to tap into pure and adulterated spirit and build a picture of a worthy ideal, your heart's desire. I don't care if it costs a zillion dollars. If you want it, you'll have it. 
Conrad Hilton sat in a raunchy little hotel in Cisco, Texas, a hotel motel, and behind his desk was a picture of the Waldorf Astoria. He said, one day, I will buy that hotel and I'll give it to my mama for her birthday, and he did. You see, he built the image, it had to happen. Well, you build the image of your worthy ideal. It's important that you get that worthy ideal properly. You plant that idea in your heart. How do you do that? You quietly let yourself get emotionally involved. You get into the spirit of it is what you're doing. Now, the second you plant that in your heart, instantly your body moves into a new vibration. Now, the wiggly lines around the stick person are to graphically convey energy leaving the body. The A arrows, the little arrows, the A, that's energy leaving the body. We are sending that energy into the universe. The universe does the only thing it can do. It sends it back. It sends it back. And so the B is energy coming back at us. And we have magnetized ourselves. We have set ourselves into a vibration that controls the energy we send in the universe. And what we send out controls what we send back. Energy always returns to its source of origination. Everything once was perfect, and we're returning to a point that once was. Now, look at the quote that Andrew Carnegie gave Napoleon Hill. This is so beautiful. Any idea that is held in the mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, begins at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate physical form that's available. Now, there's a key phrase there. He said, any idea that's held in the mind that's emphasized, that's feared or revered. Why do you think the great sufferer in the Bible, Job, said, Lo, the thing I fear has come to visit upon me? Well, that's because he didn't hold a worthy ideal, an image. He had an image of something bad. He was probably looking through his senses at the physical. He saw lack and limitation, and that's what he held in his mind. And that's what he drew more of to him. See, this works one way or the other. It's like Moses said. Today, I give you both a blessing and a curse. Now, this is very, very important information. On page 56, here's something I learned quite a while ago, and it's probably one of the most important lessons I ever learned. Gratitude keeps you connected to your source of supply. Gratitude keeps you connected to your source of supply. I can tell you with all the sincerity any human can muster. I am so grateful for the talents and the gifts that have been stowed upon me, for the work that I'm able to do, for how I'm able to spend my days, for the people that I've attracted into my life. I go through life, I just want to keep saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so totally grateful. And you know, because I am, I know I'm staying connected and I keep drawing more of the same. Now, in the present tense, Write a statement of gratitude for your many blessings and read it daily for 90 days. Read it slowly in a calm, confident, relaxed manner. And you're going to become aware of the presence of spirit in you. You just will. That's the way it works. This is such beautiful information. Remember Andrew Carnegie's advice to Napoleon Hill. Any idea that is held in your mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate physical form that's available. You will attract whatever you need. You're literally magnetized to it. Beautiful things will walk right into your life. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. This is the end of side 10. Please fast forward the tape to the end to queue up side 9 for your next listening.